crying rooms, just to bow your heads, be still. Ask God this morning to speak to you. Would you ask him? He gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. Would you pray for me and ask God to help me? Our Father, you picture your son in the book of Hebrews as an anchor that has planted that anchor in heaven and all who are attached to it have a promise of assurance that eternity will be ours, that at the moment of death to be absent from this body is to be present with you. Lord Jesus said, you said that you give eternal life to us, that we will never perish, that no one will be able to snatch us out of your hand and your Father who has given those who believe to you that no one is able to take them out of his hand. Thank you for the Spirit who's our down payment, our earnest that what you began you will finish. Thank you that when we understand this unchanging eternal grace that it motivates us to deny ungodliness and to live holy and righteously in this age. So as we come to your word this morning, we come with a deep sense of worship, wanting to give you praise, and with a deep sense of hunger, wanting to understand your word that we might grow in respect to our salvation. I pray your blessing upon this meeting, all who are listening, all who will listen, and I pray for our meeting even tonight that you would bring people who need a church home, some who need salvation to meet the pastor. May you be glorified. Spirit of God, help me, fill me, anoint me, use me. Without you, I can't do anything. With you, all things are possible, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take God's word this morning, please, and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. If you are joining us for the first time, we are in a series that I've entitled God's Prophetic Schedule. And we, last time, just cracked the door on a series of coming judgments that will happen at the second coming and another judgment that we are yet to study that will happen at the end of the millennial reign of the Christ. And uh, just as there are different kinds of courts in the world today, there's federal courts, state courts, city courts, all kinds of different courts. Everyone that meets God will not meet him in the same judgment. And so we underscored last time, contrary to the way most people think, and sadly, most biblically ignorant Christians, they think there's just one big judgment, and that's not true. And so we're looking at a number of different judgments. This one, this morning, that we'll focus on happens at the end of the tribulation period. So the next event to happen is the rapture of the church. It's a non-prophetically driven event. It could happen today. Jesus could sweep his people up into heaven. The word rapture, harpazo, to be caught up, to meet the Lord in the air. And from the Latin Bible, we get our English word rapture. Shortly thereafter, there will be a treaty signed by the Antichrist, a covenant with Israel, and it will begin a seven-year period. And shortly after the seven-year period, Jesus will literally, physically, actually come to the earth. And the judgment that we're going to study this morning deals with that particular judgment. In fact, a number of judgments happen at the second coming. Matthew chapter 25, follow along as we begin reading in verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another and the shep- as the shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? 
And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers or sisters, you could say, of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me some, nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now we've been unfolding a series of parables. We briefly looked at the end of chapter 24, the parable of the two servants. And then last time we studied in depth two parables, the parable of the ten virgins, and then the parable of the eight talents. And all of these parables reveal inward condition, that if someone is rightly related to God, that inward condition will show itself outwardly. And this portion of Scripture, though certainly not a parable, is no different from what we have been learning thus far. And the description of this judgment happens, as we'll see this morning, at the second coming. At the great white throne judgment that happens at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus, there's no separation that takes place. If you've read Revelation 20, 11 to 15, the only people who are present are unbelievers. And so this is what we typically refer to as the sheep and the goats judgment. And if you're using the outline, there's one in the bulletin or one online you can print out. There are four critical truths that you might want to jot down for further study and reflection this week. First, the time of this judgment. I want us to think about the time of this judgment. We read now in verse 31, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. So the time is clear when the Son of Man comes in his glory. This is not when we meet the Lord in the air and in the twinkling of an eye we are caught up and raptured and translated and carried to heaven that where he is, we will be also. This is when Jesus comes to the earth. Zechariah says he will plant his feet on the Mount of Olives and we'll study it further later on. But this is actually where that judgment takes place. He is on the Temple Mount in between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. There's the Kidron Valley. It's also called the Valley of Decision by the prophet Joel. Jesus had already spoken in Matthew 16 and verse 27 when he said of this judgment, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will repay every man according to their deeds. Just as the believer at the Christian's judgment in heaven Salvation is a gift. It's not a reward for what you do. The gift of God is eternal life, Paul will write, not of work so that no one can brag, but your service for the Lord is rewarded in heaven. He rewards you according to your deeds. Even so, he will separate these two groups of people according to their deeds because their works will either shout, I know the Lord, or their works will shout, I'm an unbeliever. Understand, works do not save you, and if you read this portion of Scripture as liberal theologians habitually use it to teach salvation by works, they are missing the whole flow of the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus taught you're not saved by works, and it misses the point that works are simply the fruit of salvation. So the grace of God, Paul will write in Titus, the grace of God slide that brings salvation, what does it do? It instructs us. It brings salvation to all men. The grace of God is sufficient to save anyone. Jesus died for all men, but it only instructs us, that is those who are believers, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And so if a person doesn't have a new heart, because when you're born again, you are a new creature in Christ. If you don't have a new heart, then you won't have a new life. And there's a lot of people going around today who say they're saved and born again, but they live no differently than the world. Now, if you will recall last time, 
Again, he's coming back in this portion of Scripture to see who is going to enter into the kingdom. We saw that the terms the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably. And I gave you several scriptural examples where within two verses of each other describing the same event, Jesus uses it interchangeably. But we also saw that the term the kingdom or the kingdom of God is used in three sense. Broadly speaking, Christ is on his throne. He has a kingdom today. God is in heaven. He is ruling. And so King David can write in Psalm 145, 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. On the other hand, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God has a spiritual dimension to it. And so Jesus, when he was before Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. In Luke's gospel, Jesus told believers, the kingdom of God is within you. Meaning simply when we are saved, when we have had a birth from above, and unless you've been born again, Jesus said, you'll never see the inside of heaven. But when you are born again, you begin to experience the kingdom of God within you. But there's a third dimension to the kingdom, and there's a literal physical dimension when Jesus comes back to the earth and he will rule and reign. He taught us to pray in what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. In Luke's gospel, he said, when you pray, say. So there's nothing wrong with repeating the Lord's prayer. It's never wrong to quote scripture back to God. But it's not simply what you say. He also said, when you pray, pray in this way. He's teaching us how to pray. And among other things, he said, you are to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That has never happened but it is going to happen. Jesus didn't teach us to pray for something that's not going to happen. But when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying for the coming kingdom that he speaks about. And so the kingdom of heaven will literally come to the earth. And so Isaiah really gives us a picture of the various dimensions of God's kingdom. Sometimes as we've seen, And in Old Testament prophecy, the whole plan and program of God is given in a single verse or a single paragraph, including both the first and the second coming. And so Isaiah 9, 6, a baby is going to be born and the government will rest on his shoulders. The baby being born happened at the first coming. The government never rested on his shoulders at the first coming. And for that reason, many Jews rejected him. He's not the kind of Messiah we want. We don't want the suffering servant of Isaiah. We want the sovereign king who will put Rome under our heels. But the fact that there's a kingdom is announced even at his birth. Mary was told and promised in Nazareth, your son, he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Passages like Revelation 11, 15 echoes this truth. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And if you know that chapter, he fast forwards and he projects to the end when Jesus comes back to the earth. And when he does, we are told in Revelation 20 and in verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So there's coming a day, literally in the future, when Jesus will reign. And so here, that's what's in view in verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit, literally, on his glorious throne. Now, if you know Matthew's gospel, you know one of his favorite titles for Jesus is the Son of Man. And if you know the book of Daniel, you know that's where we are introduced to the title the Son of Man. Daniel is given a vision, and in Daniel 7 and verse 13, you might want to put that in the margin. He said, I kept looking in the night visions, and the cloud, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, a descriptive term of the Father, and was presented before him. So the term Son of Man is a messianic title. And it's an important title because it underscores that Jesus is not simply God. A baby will be born whose name will be called Mighty God, but he's also human. He is the Son of Man. And the title is used 81 times in the Gospels, either by Jesus or someone speaking of him. 
And it's a title that really reflects his humility, as Paul describes in Philippians, that he left the glory and splendor of heaven and humbled himself by becoming a man. Three critical titles given of Jesus in the scripture. He's the son of man. That speaks of his humanity. He's the son of David. That speaks of his royalty. And he's the son of God. That speaks of his deity. And actually all three are bled together in Isaiah chapter nine, a text we often read at Christmas. When he said a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. That speaks of his humility. Uh, his title is the Son of Man, his humanity, his humility, and the government will rest on his shoulders. That speaks of his royalty, that he will reign as king, as the son of David. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. That speaks of his deity, that he is indeed the Son of God. And for a Jew to mention one was basically to affirm all three. When you said you are the son of man or the son of God, you're also saying you're the son of David. And that's clearly implied by the dialogue, if you remember, that Jesus had just before his crucifixion with Caiaphas. Caiaphas put him under oath. He said, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the son of God. And so when asked if he is indeed the son of God, Jesus responds by saying, I'm the son of man. And he quotes Daniel 7. You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see, and he quotes Daniel 7, 13. You will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus claimed that he is the person referred to in Daniel 7. And of course, The high priest Caiaphas understood his claim clearly, that it was a claim that he was God in human flesh, and so he said, you have blasphemed, and he tore his robes. The Lord would often use the title Son of Man, underscore that God had become one of us, but he also used the term Son of God to affirm that he was no ordinary person. Revelation 1.7 quotes the prophet Daniel, behold, he is coming with the clouds. And then a few verses later in Revelation 1.13, John sees one who is like the son of man. And when he comes, he will come with a crown on his head. And the word for crown is the word Stephanus. And it speaks of a victor's crown, that he is coming as a ruler. He is coming as a king. He is coming as a judge. Interestingly, the very first time in the New Testament the Son of Man designation is given of Jesus, he used it. He said the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, meaning he owned nothing. In Revelation 14, the last time the term the Son of Man is used, he will be seen as having everything. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. So verse 31 here in our passage speaks of the Son of Man when he comes in his glory. And Jesus had already referenced this. If you look up on the page a little bit to chapter 24 and verse 30, notice, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. In other words, he is going to return to the earth with a brilliant display of his glory. Revelation 14, 14 describes when he comes with this brilliance and this glory that he's coming as a judge. Listen to these words. Then I looked, behold, a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. That's what the scripture affirms. He's coming with a sickle. He's coming as a harvester. And as we'll see in our passage, he will separate the believers from the unbelievers. And all judgment indeed has been given to the son. And so people today think, well, I can believe in God without acknowledging the son. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because we have planted and sown evil ways, and if we die unforgiven, then we will not meet him as a savior. We will meet him as a judge. Paul will say, God is not mocked. Do not be deceived that whatever a man sows, that he indeed will reap. And as we underscored last time, all judgment has been entrusted to Jesus. 
Remember what Jesus said in John 5, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. By the way, that's a claim to deity. Jesus is the judge, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Notice, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You cannot say, well, I believe in God, I just don't believe in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, you are not honoring the Father, and he will not honor you in that day. He's wearing a crown. He's got a sickle in his hand. He's coming as a harvester, and we will all meet him. We will either meet him as our Savior and as our King, or we will meet him as our judge. So that's the theology. That's some of the theology. Remember, this is a Jewish gospel. They understood these things. But that's some of the theology behind verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, the timing of this is very important. And there are two time words that you should circle in your Bible. One in this verse is the word when, and the other is the word then. The judgment is related when the Son of Man comes back on the clouds in glory. This is the second coming. When every eye will see him. In the rapture, we're caught up. We meet the Lord in the air. It happens so fast. Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye. But this is when he comes to sit on his glorious throne. And then circle the word then. This is not the throne of God in heaven. This is the earthly throne that the New Testament spoke spoke about, that the Old Testament prophets wrote about. The idea that the Messiah will literally rule on the earth is not a New Testament doctrine. It's sprinkled all the way through the prophets, starting in the Torah. Moses even underscores it. The length of it is something we learn from the New Testament. For instance, the prophet Jeremiah prophesies of the time when Messiah will come. And he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely, and do justice and righteousness where? In the land. This is a physical, literal kingdom on the earth. So when Matthew writes of the time when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, he too is describing the time when his throne will be on the earth. It's remarkable. It's what we pray for. It's what God's saints have prayed for since the inception of the church. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that's the time of the judgment. And as we'll see in verses 31 through, or 32 to 46, this is certainly not a parable. This is a description of that judgment so that God can weed out those who will not enter into this kingdom. So consider with me also not just the time of the judgment, but the subjects of the judgment, the sub- subjects of this judgment. We're told now beginning in verse 32. And all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them from one another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Again, if you read Revelation 20, 11 to 15, the great white throne judgment, who is present? Only unbelievers. There's no separation there. He's gathering all the unbelievers of all time for the final of all judgments. And when we come to that judgment, we'll see why he waits to the very end. And it's a very important reason. But the context here is on the earth, there's believers and unbelievers. And notice the term Gentiles or nations in most of our English Bibles. You could translate it either way. The ethnoi, the Gentiles, the nations. It's a descriptive word in the Greek New Testament to describe someone who is not Jewish. Now, in our Western minds, when we hear the word nations, we think of political entities, countries like the U.S. or Canada or Germany or France. But it's never once used ever in Scripture of some political geographical entity, only of racial ethnicities. And that becomes clear. And so here are Gentiles who are alive. Now, if you've read... Revelation 6 through 18, you discover that several billion people die during the time of the Great Tribulation. The judgments as they come in seal trumpet in bold judgments are devastating. Those Gentiles are already dead. Then, of course, as we studied in this prophetic schedule, the Battle of Armageddon, when all the nations of the world go against Israel, Jesus, by the word from his mouth, will strike dead 
all those nations, those potentially, I suppose, maybe millions of people who formed that great army to go against the people of Israel. So who are these folks? These are the non-combatants who have survived the great tribulation period. And I want you to see that there are two major groups, Gentiles and Jews, and the Gentiles are divided into believers or unbelievers. So three descriptive terms in the text. Don't miss it or you'll miss the whole meaning of it. There are sheep, there are goats, and there are my brethren. And my brethren here, as we'll see, is a reference to the Jewish people. And that's important. Now remember, one of the principal reasons when we studied the tribulation period that God is going to allow it is he wants to bring his Jewish people to faith in Jesus. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And Moses looked down the corridors of time when he wrote Deuteronomy, and he saw this coming time, and he wrote about not only events when Jesus would come the first time, but also when he would come a second time. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30, looking at the second coming, when you are in distress, speaking of the Jewish people, when you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you when? In the latter days. And if you've been with us in this series, we define that that is a term that is used for the very end of time, just before Jesus comes back to the earth. In the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. So he predicted this time of distress when the Jewish people are going to feel such pain that God will have their attention. Sometimes that's what God does today, is it not? You go through a deep trial, things are difficult, and sometimes it's not until the bottom falls out that you begin to look up. Hosea the prophet, by the way, wrote of this same coming time frame. Listen to these words from Hosea chapter five. I will go away and return to myself. The Messiah was here, he went away and he went back to heaven. I will go away and return to my place until, underscore that in your thinking, until they, the nation of Israel, acknowledge their guilt and seek my face in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Until the Jewish people turn to Jesus in faith, he will not come back. And so the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, alas, for that day, this day of affliction is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress or the time of Jacob's trouble, depending on your English Bible, but he, Israel, will be delivered or saved from it. So that's again one of the chief functions. Everything is going to change during this time. Listen to the prophet Zechariah, the 12th chapter. God prophesies, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over firstborn. In the future, during the great tribulation, during the time of Jacob's trouble, God the Father promises he will pour out God the Spirit such that men will look on him whom they have pierced. He's describing the crucifixion. And of course, the order here is important. First, he pours out the spirit of grace and supplication, and that brings about mourning where they look on him. They are weeping. And it's not until they understand spiritually who Jesus is and their need for him for salvation, will they see him literally physically. He cannot come back. He cannot come back for the second coming until the Jewish people repent. That's what Jesus said. We studied it in Matthew 23, 39. Do you remember? For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me. Who is he speaking to? All Jewish people. You, the Jewish nation, will not see me until, and he quotes that great messianic psalm, Psalm 118, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so while the rapture is imminent, it could happen before this day is finished, the second coming of Jesus to the earth cannot happen 
until the Jewish people in faith call upon him. And of course, for that to happen, as you read Zechariah, they have to be in the land of Israel. They were not there for 1,900 years, but they're there today, and most of the Jews on the planet are there, and they will confess Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. By the way, this is the time that Paul describes when all Israel will be saved. Listen to these words from Romans chapter 11 and verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And while we're here, let me just say parenthetically, when the scripture says all Israel will be saved, it does not mean that every Jew will be saved. This is an abused text of Scripture. In fact, there are some, too, who say, well, because all Israel will be saved, they teach what's called dual covenant theology, that you do not have to believe in Jesus as a Jew to go to heaven. That's not true. No one comes to the Father but through him. Jesus said to the Jewish leaders in his day in John 8, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am he, literally God in human flesh contextually, you will die in your sin. In John 3, 18, Jesus said, or John said of Jesus, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged or condemned already. Why? Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now let me read Romans 11, 25 and 26 together. Pay attention. This is an important theological framework that the Jewish people in the first century had that most of us sadly today don't know. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Now, Revelation 11, I mean 7, again, teaches us that during this seven-year period, the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, We're not told how they're saved. The church has been gone. Maybe it will be like a Damascus Road conversion. 144,000 Jewish people will be converted, and they will serve as missionaries, and they'll be indestructible. People who hate them and want to kill them, they won't be able to, which says a lot about God's patience and long-suffering and God's heart for people that none should perish because he wants them to preach the gospel. Plus, there'll be two witnesses on the Temple Mount, and for the first time in all of human history, an angel who will preach the gospel. And during that time, all Israel will be saved. Now, all Israel is a collective all, not an each and every all. And so sometimes in the scripture, when it says all, you have to ask, does he mean each and every person or collectively? For instance, in Matthew 2, it's a collective all. Herod was troubled And all Jerusalem was troubled with him. Did it mean that every single person in Jerusalem was troubled? No. But as a whole, they were troubled. And understand, this same kind of distinction is made in passages like Romans 9 and verse 6. Paul said, for they are not all Israel who descended from Israel. In other words, just because you are a physical descendant of Abraham doesn't mean you're a part of all Israel who will be saved. They are not all Israel who simply descended from Jacob. Only those who have been circumcised in the heart who have been born again. And so the scripture here in in Romans 11 makes a distinction during this time frame of the fullness of the Gentiles. What's the fullness of the Gentiles? It's different from the time of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles is that time frame because when he came to his own, his own received him not. They rejected Jesus. Now, did every Jew reject him? Of course not. There is a remnant. At least 30,000 Jews believe Yeshua was the savior of the world as you read the Acts of the Apostles and the early church fathers. So they didn't all reject him, but overall, collectively, they did reject him. So what did God do? God changed gears. Instead of working exclusively through the nation of Israel, now he's working through the body of Christ, comprised of Jew and Gentile. But it's largely a Gentile church. And Gentiles are preaching the gospel, along with some Jews who represent a remnant. But when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, when when the last Gentiles in the church age are going to believe, God switches arenas, and he puts the Jew on top, and it's the Jew who begins to preach the gospel. 
So Paul has been describing a partial hardening in Romans 11. Not every Jew has been hardened. I was introduced to Christ largely through a Jewish man, Ellis Goldstein. Not all Jews are unbelief. We have a Jewish believer here this morning sitting with us in, in this service. Not all Jews are lost. But overall, it's just a remnant today. Well, just like when the Scripture speaks of the fullness of the Gentiles, it doesn't mean every Gentile will be saved. When the Scripture says all Israel will be saved, it doesn't mean every single Gentile, uh, every single Jew will be saved. But understand, this salvation is going to precede the second coming. Jesus cannot come back until, until, until. And so these people who erase the role of Israel in God's prophetic plan, they are blinded the church, they poked out their own spiritual eyes, and they put the church to sleep. Jesus cannot come back at the second coming until the Jewish people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And again, sadly, here's a text of Scripture. I read it once, let me read it again, that is often abused. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. What's he talking about? I've heard people say this and they're just wrong they've not let scripture interpret scripture and they've created this picture that when jesus comes in the sky and they see those nail scarred hands that the jewish people will then believe and be converted nothing could be further from the truth and god would be less than just because he would have a double standard do you think gentiles when jesus comes and they see the sign of the son of man in the sky Oh, I was wrong. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, save me. It will be too late. There will be no opportunity. Remember, we just read Hosea, Jeremiah, Matthew 23. Jesus cannot come back until first they believe in him. It's much like what Paul did with the Galatians. Do you remember in Galatians? He said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, this is many years into the church. Did the Galatians, they had never heard the name of Jesus till Paul came, did they see Jesus crucified? Of course not. But Paul publicly portrayed him. It's a, it's a Greek word. He billboarded him. He, he painted a clear picture of what Jesus had done for them on the cross so that they could be forgiven. Look, there are thousands, perhaps, or hundreds, perhaps, thousands of people that saw Jesus crucified, and they didn't all respond by any stretch. But when Paul paints a picture as to the meaning of the cross, these Galatians believe, and they receive Jesus' payment for their sin. In Zechariah 12, he's contrasting it with Zechariah 11. There's two shepherds. Zechariah 11, there's the foolish shepherd. In the New Testament, he's also called the Antichrist. And they're going to repel the foolish shepherd, and they're going to embrace the good shepherd, Jesus whom they have pierced. How are they going to know to do that? Because their Jewish brethren are going to be preaching the gospel, and they are going to realize that Jesus is Lord. It's going to be remarkable. And so certainly they will mourn and weep. Oh, we rejected our Savior, and no doubt when they see him in the sky, they will mourn but they will have already been converted. And the warrant, mourn, the text says, as one mourns for an only son. You ever lose a child? It's a heartbreak. An only son, even as weeping over a firstborn because the Jewish people understood that a Jewish bat, dad understood that the firstborn, he is the one who carried on the family name and the family property. So understand that while we are looking this morning at the judgment of the Gentiles, there is a judgment at the second coming. It appears to happen first of the Jewish people because not every Jew who will be there will be alive. Here's a passage of Scripture that will be helpful to us. It's the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 20, and I want to begin to read verses 33 to 38 where Jesus 
will separate believing Jews from unbelieving Jews. And this prophet writes about it centuries before. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands. And so he's describing, if you remember, there's the gathering that's happening today, but then at the end of the age, all those Jews who hadn't come back, he's going to bring them back into the land where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face, as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness in the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge from you the rebels... And those who transgress against me, he's talking about unbelieving Jews. And I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you shall know I am the Lord. Remember, he's establishing his kingdom. And as we will underscore, and this becomes very important for what's going to follow in the future weeks, the only people who enter into the kingdom are believers. So the believing Jews are separated from the unbelieving Jews. Remember, just like there are different courts in America, Supreme Court, federal courts, state courts, local courts, city courts, all the judgments are not the same. Here's a picture. I gave this to you last week. Uh, I suppose I could do a whole series just on this if you bring up the chart. The judgments and resurrection that takes place at the second coming. We'll come to this, Lord willing, next time, the raising of the Old Testament saints. Old Testament saints don't go up with the church. Daniel 12, 1 says they go up after that time that is unprecedented in human history. Jesus virtually quotes it in the Olivet Discourse, that the tribulation will be unlike any time in any that humans have ever known on the face of the earth, and unless that time had been cut short, nobody would have survived. That's Daniel 12, 1. And then in Daniel 12, too, you have these Old Testament saints who are raised up. Right now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those folks, they're not in their resurrection bodies, just like your loved ones who've gone home to be with Jesus. They're not in their resurrection bodies yet. We're waiting for the rapture. The dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up. Well, at the end of that seven-year period, Old Testament saints will be raised. Then, of course, secondly on the chart here, there's the raising of dead tribulation saints. If you remember in the Revelation, you have this picture of all these people who refused to deny Jesus as Lord and to follow Antichrist. They refused to take the number of his name, 666. What happens? Their heads are cut off. And they're up there in heaven. Oh, Lord, how much longer before you deal with the injustices that we have encountered? And so when are they raised? The Revelation 24, 46, at the second coming. They don't go up with the church, obviously, because they're not believers when the church goes up. Third here, bring up the next one. There's the judgment of living Israel. I just gave you one of many passages like Ezekiel 20. We could have looked at Ezekiel 39 when God separates believing Jews from unbelieving Jews. In addition, next chart, if you will, bring it up. There's the judgment of living Gentiles. That's what we're going to look at this morning when God deals with all the nations of the world. And then finally, there's the judgment of the Antichrist and the false prophet. That also happens at the second coming. Jesus will literally judge those two men, and they will be the very first recipients to go into the lake of fire. Now, that's part of the theology behind verse 31. I hope I haven't lost you. Stay with me. Verse 31, but when the Son of Man comes in glory and all of the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, let's go to verse 32. And all the nations will be gathered before him, And he will separate them from one another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So to help these readers and us to understand how these believers will be separated, 
from unbelievers, Jesus uses a common imagery of shepherding. Here's a photo taken when we were in Israel. These are Bedouins. You see them out in the desert all the time. I mean, they just live some really hard lives. Though some of the Bedouins now have Jeeps, I noticed, and almost all of them have cell phones, different from when I went there for the first time in Israel in 1989, but you will see them. Here's an early morning shepherd. He's got all his sheep and goats, and he's heading out to the fields. And they would be mixed together during the day as they would um, graze. And of course, this is the imagery that Jesus is using when he comes back as the chief shepherd, as a good shepherd. He is going to separate it. And of course, a, a shepherd can easily distinguish, maybe not like us, but they can easily distinguish between a sheep and a goat. Sheep have very full coats very fluffy, and the way we breed them in the West are even fluffier than in some parts of the world. And, and goats, of course, they have hair. We get cashmere and mohair, right, from goats. You love the beautiful cashmere goat. And there are other differences. Here's a difference in their mouth. Here's a sheep in his mouth. You'll see the lips are very distinct. They have a clear middle groove separating the upper lip from the lower lip. Here's a goat. The divide is not so pronounced. Um, but again, a shepherd is very, very familiar. Here's another distinction in terms of their tails. Bring up the next. Here's, here's a goat. A goat's tail is always up. The exception is if he's sick or scared. Goats walk around with their tail raised. Here's some sheep. They have, as you can see in the background, all the tails are down. I think that one in the foreground, his tail was docked. But in either case, they have their tails down when they walk around. So there's some real differences, and there are some differences in diet as well. Um, the sheep are grazers. They eat the grass and clover on the ground, whereas the goats, they tend to eat from the neck up. Uh, they don't eat so much on the ground, but they eat what is from their mouth up, whether it's bark or tree leaves or, or the like. And so during the day, they can graze together without some big fight. Hmm. At the end of the day, it's a different story. They have to be separated. Why? Because when goats are mixing with sheep in a confined pen that would be made out of wood or stone, they get very agitated, and sometimes they'll even fight and kill the young little lambs. And so at night, the shepherd would separate the two. Jesus is using that imagery. Verse 33. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, this happened at the end of the day in the first century. This will happen at the end of the age at the second coming. There's going to be a great separation that will take place. Now, notice, if you will, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom. Look at the words that follow. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So he turns to these sheep on his right, and he says they are blessed of his Father. And again, these sheep are these believing Gentiles who have embraced Jesus as Lord. You might want to write out in the margin two verses, Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Let me read that. I think it sheds some light on verse 34. There Daniel writes, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, to the Father, and they brought him near before him. And again, we've already noted the Son of Man. It's a term used of the Messiah. And he comes to the Father, and the Father's going to give him a kingdom. Look at verse 14. Then to him, to the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So here in verse 34... The king is the son of man. Um, and again, that's an important verse of scripture. And he's fulfilling here in verse 34 what Daniel wrote 550 years before Christ. The son of man's gonna come. He's gonna have a kingdom. Matthew is describing when that kingdom is given to the son. The, the Bible is amazing. It's written over 1,500 years on three different continents in three different languages by some 40 different men. 
most of whom never met each other, but there's one flow of thought from Genesis to Revelation because behind each and every human author, there's one divine author, God the Holy Spirit. And so notice here, of these saved who are blessed of my Father, they are invited, look at the text, to inherit the kingdom prepared for you when? From the foundation of the world. Does that sound familiar? From the foundation of the world. Now, the Calvinists would say, you see, it's all fixed. God made this decision from the foundation of the world and you have no say in it. Let's think our way through that because the text says from the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.4 echoes this truth. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be, <clears throat> excuse me, holy and blameless before him. So as you read the New Testament, it is very clear that even before the foundation of the world, as Matthew's gospel is affirming here, God knew who the blessed ones were. That's why the apostle John will write this in Revelation 13 and verse 8. He'll write about all who dwell on the earth, or earth dwellers, unbelievers, will worship him, the Antichrist, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that has been slain. Now look, if your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, you won't go to heaven. And God tells us that he wrote the names in the Lamb's book of life when? Before the foundation of the world. In Acts 1, the scripture says, you, Lord, know the hearts of all men. I think that what we have descriptive in Ephesians and many other passages is God's foreknowledge, God's beforehand knowledge. And God knew from the foundation of the world God wouldn't be God if God didn't know who would be saved and who would not be saved. Remember in the same way, on Paul's first missionary journey, he comes to a place called Pisidian Antioch. And there in Pisidian Antioch, we're told in Acts 13, and when the Gentiles heard this, the gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Oh, it's all rigged. <laughs> no choice. That's what my dear Calvinist friends would say. Now, non-Calvinists would tend to soften this word appointed, but you can't soften it. The Greek word literally means to ordain or to assign into a particular classification to inscribe or to enroll. We just read about those who were enrolled in the Lamb's Book of Life. So first of all, let me just say, without you getting too ruffled, <laughs> the doctrine of election is not a Calvinistic doc doctrine. The doctrine of election is a biblical doctrine. And if you don't believe in the doctrine of election, you don't believe in the Bible. Every Bible-believing Christian believes in the doctrine of election. We just read, he chose us. It's the Greek word that we get our word elect. He elected us before the foundation of the world. Every Bible-believing Christian believes in the doctrine of election. The question is, don't shut me out, not if God elects, but how he elects. And therein lies the distinction. How does God elect? Now, John Calvin taught what's called unconditional election. That before the foundation of the world, God chose out of the mass of humanity some to be saved. And some Calvinists teach double predestination, that God created some for salvation and others for damnation. And they would love to use Acts 13, 48, as many as is appointed to eternal life believed. But let's think our way through this. Now, let me say first because I don't want you to think that I'm on an Arminian, if you know what that term means. Salvation in the initiative didn't begin with you. It began with God Almighty. The scripture says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. I've had hundreds of caskets down here over the years. I don't stand over a casket and say, hey man, your, your, your tie, it's a little bit out of, could you straighten it out? It's dead. Dead men can't respond. People who are dead and their trespasses and sins cannot respond. So it's God who initiates. Well, on what basis does God initiate? Well, let's think about this word, foreknowledge. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, we're told that we are chosen, how? According to the foreknowledge of God. That's what Paul said in Romans 8. Those whom he foreknew, 
He chose. We're chosen here according to the foreknowledge of God. So how do we find the, define the word foreknowledge? Well, it's two Greek words bled together. The word gnosis, we get our word gnostic or knowledge from it. And the word pra, we get our word pre. It means before knowledge. God in his before knowledge knew who would respond to his initiative, to his stirring, and who as an act of their own free will chose to call upon Jesus in faith. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter is speaking about these false teachers who will come into the church and try to bring about turmoil, and, and he says that they distort the Scripture to their own destruction. And then he says, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, same word, pro just in verbal form, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you're not carried away by the error of unscrupulous people and lose your own firm commitment. He is saying because you have prior knowledge that this is what's going to happen, evil men are going to come in and try to knock you off kilter. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. I'm giving you this pre-knowledge. Paul uses the same verb in Acts 26 when he's describing his Jewish brethren who knew all about him. And he said, since they have known about me, there it is, prognosco, since they have known about me, they had this prior knowledge for a long time. If they're willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the restrictive sect of our religion, then, then, then let them testify. It just means prior knowledge. God in eternity past could write the name of every single person who would believe. You know, we used to have a, new, a song, there's a new name written down in glory. No, there's not. It's written down in glory before the foundation of the world. Because God in eternity past saw how men dead in their trespasses and sins would respond to the Spirit of God stirring them. Now, that's not the way the Calvinist sees it. R.C. Sproul is a Calvinist. He's a good brother. He's in heaven now. I'm grateful for many of the things he taught, but he was just really discombobulated on a number of things. He said, and I quote, when God foreknows a person, he sets his love upon him. Our Lord's choice of men and women for salvation is based on his decision to set his love upon them, not his knowledge of what they will do. See the difference? But he is reinterpreting the use of prognosco, whether it's used as a noun or as a verb. And so he's not speaking of the prognosis of God. And that word prognosis, prior knowledge, comes right into English today and it has its meaning hasn't changed. He is speaking here of the forelove of God. John Calvin. Now understand Calvin. He's like the one who waves this flag. And he waves it because he was a disciple of Augustine. And like Augustine, who in many ways displayed a lot of anti-Semitism, so did John Calvin. And so when John Calvin comes to Romans 9, 10, and 11, because he believes God is done with the Jewish people, he comes out of Catholicism. The Roman Catholic Church said, we are now the chosen people, not the Jewish people. We are the new Israel of God. And Calvin just put a different spin on it and said, no, the body of Christ is the new Israel. Well, God is certainly working through the church, but he has not usurped the role the Jews will play. And so John Calvin said this about the Jews. He said, quote, the Jews are a rotten and unbending people whose obstinance deserves that they be oppressed without measure or end and that they die in their misery without pit the pity of anyone. I wouldn't want to meet the Lord having said that about the Jewish people. So when he comes to Romans 9, 10, and 11, and this is not intended to be a full-blown sermon on the doctrine of election. I preached like 10 messages in 9, 10, and 11, if you really want to study it. Romans 9, for Calvin, was not God choosing a nation out of all the nations of the world, but choosing you to go to heaven and you to go to hell. No, Romans 9 is with Israel's election. Romans 10, their current rejection, their current unbelief. Romans 11, their future restoration. So Paul asks in Romans 11 in verse 1, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Talking about the Jewish people. Meganoida, may it never be. For I too am an Israelite, 
a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Then he plainly states in verse 2 of the same chapter, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Romans 11, 2 is simply referring to God's prior knowledge of Israel that he knew that when the Messiah came, they would in their self-righteousness, just like Gentiles today who think they're good enough to get into heaven, they turn their back on Jesus. But in their faithful, faithlessness, God was faithful to them. You see, the end of Romans 8, if you remember, is nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the natural question would be, wait a minute, God, over and over and over again, you said in the Old Testament, you love the nation of Israel with an everlasting love. Now they've rejected you. Do you still love them with an everlasting love? That's 9, 10, and 11. He illustrates the everlasting love. Yes, I selected them. Yes, they're in unbelief, but I haven't forsaken them because I'm going to restore them. That's chapter 11. Now, back here in our text, Matthew 25, verse 34. When it speaks about those who will inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world, God could see those who would respond to the wooing work of the Spirit. Uh, in case you're interested, in case you know the terms, people say, are you a Calvinist or are you Arminian? I'm neither. I'm a Calvinian. <laughs> there's, there's degrees of truth. Who do I believe the elect are? The elect of the whosoever wills, the non-elect of the whosoever wants. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so those sheep who have believed in our omniscient God, knew it in eternity past, invites them into the kingdom prepared. Now, let's go to the third point. Beyond the time of the second, the time of this judgment, which is the second coming, beyond the subject, which are Gentiles saved the sheep and lost the goats, that brings us now to the basis of the judgment. I'm almost done. Stay with me. Don't fall asleep. The basis of the judgment, verses 35 and following. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. Now remember, there are two groups of people here. The first group are the nations who are subdivided into sheep and goats, saved and lost. And the sheep are saved not by the things they do. They prove their faith by the things they do. Look at verse 37. He said, then the righteous will answer. How do you get righteous in God's sight? By the things you do, nothing could be further from the truth. Our righteousness, the prophet said, is like a filthy rag. Our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Not your bad deeds, not your wicked deeds, but the best deeds you have ever done in God's sight are like filthy rags because they're tainted and polluted with sin. No, righteousness is the gift of God. It's imputed and it's credited to you. But if you have been credited with righteousness, that means you're born again. You see, the Spirit of God can't come live inside of you until God declares you righteous. And he can't declare you righteous until you receive Jesus as Lord. That's a major point running all the way through Matthew, that you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. But when you're born again, your life changes. Then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked or clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Naturally, there is a little bit of confusion here because they have never seen Jesus with his physical eyes any more than any of us have. When did we see you in this state? And the king, verse 40, answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. In other words, he's saying to these Gentiles, you can be divided into sheep or goats on the way you treated my brethren, the Jewish people. Now, remember, in Scripture, God often identifies a believer by the way he treats his people. Even in the church age, John can write, we know we've passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love the brethren. There are people who will come here and they think, oh, you know, okay, I came to church. Maybe I'll come back in five years. <laughs> they don't love the brethren. If you're born again, just like you have a love for your physical family, assuming it's healthy, if you're born again, you'll have a love for the born ones, the children of God. You'll have an affinity for the people of God. God identifies with his people. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says on the Damascus road. 
what do you mean? Well, whatever you did to these people, my church, you're doing to me. And that's the identification here. The way you treated Israel, believing Israel, is what you were doing to me. And again, if you read the prophet Zechariah, during the time of the tribulation, a lot of the Jewish people will die. In fact, two-thirds will. And those who make it, what's the attitude of all the nations of the world? You know, there's a spirit of anti-Semitism that is growing like I've never seen in my life. It's growing. It's deepening. It's broadening. People are boldly saying things about the Jewish people that they haven't said since Hitler's day. There's coming a time after the church is removed when the Bible teaches all the nations of the world are going to go against Israel. Listen to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 3. It will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples and all who lift it will be severely injured injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Jesus is just simply saying under these conditions when all the nations of the world are going to oppose Israel, That's the battle of Armageddon. All the nations will go against her. Those believing Gentiles who have the real thing, they will stand for Israel no matter what. Now, quickly, the results of this judgment. The results of this judgment. There's no room for anti-Semites in the coming kingdom. What are the results? Well, notice the contrast with the goats, the unbelieving Gentiles. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. By the way, if you die and go to hell, you'll be trespassing. Because God didn't create hell for man. He created hell for the devil and his angels. And it's eternal. It doesn't burn out. You don't just die and go there for a week. It's forever and ever and ever. Ionion is used to describe eternal life, eternal death, and the eternal God. And so how will they show that there weren't real believers? Verse 42, I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. Thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't invite me, visit me. I'll say, well, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? He will answer truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least of these, my Jewish brethren, you did not do it to me. Again, he's not dealing with the root of faith, but the fruit of faith. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. By the way, there's no purgatory. It's heaven or hell, there's no in between. How are we gonna apply this? Let me ask three questions that I want each of us to ask of ourselves. Number one, do my works show that I am one of Christ's sheep? Do my works show that I am one of his sheep? Titus 1.15 says they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. James will write in James 3.17, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. That is, faith by itself is nothing but a mere profession because the faith that does not produce a changed life, James will say, is a dead life. It's a dead faith. Jesus will put it this way, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If you're one of his sheep, you have a propensity to want to follow Jesus. They follow me, and I give. We don't earn it. I give eternal life to them. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. You don't earn eternal life. It's gifted to you. Again, you're saved by grace alone, but the grace that saves is never, ever alone. So do you have works that show you're one of his sheep? Secondly, ask this question. Am I involved in gathering Christ's sheep into the fold? Am I involved in gathering Christ's sheep into the fold? You know, sometimes I will say tongue and cheek, you know, of some, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, I'm, I'm not one as a pastor to steal sheep. If someone's in a good, healthy church, you should stay there. If it's a good, healthy church, support your pastor. Stay there. But often I'll say, but, you know, if they're in a crummy church, I, I, I want to get the goats. <laughs> but you know that's tongue and cheek because in the truest sense, Before the foundation of the world, the Lord knew who his sheep were. Jesus said, I have other sheep 
which are not of this fold, I must bring them also. They will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Of course, there he's speaking to the Gentiles that there's gonna be other believers, but they're still called sheep. And so as God's people, we're on a rescue mission. We should be trying to gather those people whom God knew in advance without changing their free will who would respond. And we should go after them. Let me just ask a question this morning. Think with me for just a moment. Of the people you love most, more than anyone else, what's your deepest, earnest desire for the people you love the most? What's your greatest desire for them? For example, parents, what's your greatest desire for your children? Is it uh, education? I want them to have a sterling education. Well, you're just going to make them clever devils to go to hell if you neglect the spiritual side. Well, I, I, I want them to be involved in the culture, you know, music, the arts, or maybe even develop their athletic skills and abilities. But you neglect the spiritual? Well, I, you know, I want them to have what I didn't have. I hear this all the time, you know. I didn't have much growing up, and I want my kids to have what I didn't have. I want to bless them beyond measure materially. What good will that do when they're raised up in the judgment and they meet a God they've never met? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and in the end he forfeits his soul? You want your children and the people around you because we are not to be concerned just of our loved ones, but we've been committed with the Great Commission to go into all the world to every creature and preach the gospel. We're to share the good news of forgiveness. Is your name this morning in the Lamb's Book of Life? It can be if you'll believe. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to a place where there's no crime? There's no murders, there's no mugging, there's no death, there's no goodbye. It's a place of perfect and infinite joy where the Lord is. Who wouldn't want to go there? You see, if we don't go there, it's because we're, we don't know the gospel, and I'm sharing it with you this morning. Or we're insubordinate. We are choosing, I don't want to yield to Jesus. Why? Because we love sin more than we love the Lord. Jesus is the only one who can get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He's the way for those of you who are lost this morning. He's the truth for those of you who have been deceived. He's the life for those of you who are looking for meaning and purpose. The thief comes only to kill and to destroy and to steal. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But you must call upon him. You must receive him as Lord and Savior. There's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Today, you can be saved today, the scripture teaches, because it's not earned, it's gifted, but you have to humbly receive the gift. Today is the day of salvation. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed this morning, no one leaving, unless it's an emergency. You're here and you're not sure of your salvation, you can be sure. Jesus didn't die for some of your sin or most of it, he died for every sin. And he proved his sinlessness and his ability to make that payment when God raised him from the dead. But you must humble yourself and admit that your sin is heinous that it needs forgiveness and changing. You must call upon him, whoever, that means you, means me, anybody, whoever will call upon the name of Jesus will be saved. Would you reach out in your heart today and say, Lord Jesus, by your death and resurrection, save even me. Our Father, you are righteous. And while this world is mocking you and making fun of you and ignoring you, your son is coming back and there will be a great separation of believers from unbelievers. But thank you for your passionate heart that you wish for none to perish but for all to come to repentance, that you desire all men to be saved. And thank you that you would privilege us to be the voice box of Jesus 
to tell men and women, boys and girls, how they can be saved and forgiven. Help us in this brand new, fresh week to be faithful with the message. We ask it in your holy name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. Maybe you're here and you've received Jesus, but you've never taken that very first step where you've made it public. Jesus taught in Matthew's gospel, if it's real on the inside, you'll be unashamed of him on the outside. And I want to give you the opportunity this morning. You can leave your seat and you're coming to this front row. We'll be saying, I'm not ashamed to say that God has saved me. Maybe you haven't taken on the symbol of salvation, baptism. The Bible says, believe and then be baptized. I want to give you that opportunity. You say, Pastor, I have been saved and baptized, but I need a church home. Every believer does. And if we can be that church for you and you want to come partner with us and serve Jesus with the people of God here, then I invite you to leave as well. Matt's going to lead us. If you have a decision, step out now. You may be in Grays, you may be in Graniteville, but you have a decision. Someone's there down front to meet you. Would you come now?